All right, so welcome to the uh, biannual honor symposium. Um, I am Michael Fatel. I'm an associate professor of English here at the college, as well as the coordinator of the honors program. Uh, today we have five honor students presenting their honors capstone projects. Um, so we'll begin with our first presenter, Valina Dizdarevic. So hello everyone and good morning. My name is Felina Dostarovic and my research project I'm presenting today is titled Criminal Minds of Juvenile Delinquents, Factors Reinforcing Juvenile Delinquency. My mentor for my final project is Angie Christian, who is an instructor on the Rome campus for the Surgical Technology Department. Does this thing work? Um, so why did I choose this topic? I grew into the subject of juveniles and being in the justice system when I was in my juveniles justices course at my previous college. Uh, I fell in love with the different cases we studied and learned about. My biggest persuasion in taking on this research project was the case I wrote my final essay for the course on, which was the Eric Smith case. Um, so that's Eric Smith, and Eric Smith murdered a four-year-old uh, boy, Derek Roby, which is the blonde-haired little boy there, uh, and they had no relation towards each other at all. Um, so this was the factor that raised uh, many questions on why juveniles committed crimes they do at such a young age that can change their lives forever. So to introduce my project, my research project is to understand why juveniles commit the crimes they do at a young age and um, what causes them to do such crimes. I wanted to determine whether environment, mental health, and media were influences. Environment would include things like the presence of drugs and alcohol in the juvenile's lives, family life at home, and social status regarding where they stand in society, as in social class. For mental health, I will be explaining how physical and sexual abuse can be a factor in how and how it can be and how it could cause mental health problems within the juvenile and media media which includes everything from video games tv programs movies and other social media like facebook instagram snapchat and twitter uh, these will also be further explained in my slides to come uh, but this is an important study topic because there has been a rise in juvenile crimes over the years, which could be detrimental to the future lives, to their future lives and their lives forever. So in this graph, uh, it shows how juveniles in detention centers have increased from May to October of 2021. So May to October of 2021, the population count is an average of 7% higher than it was for the same months in 2020 and peaked about peaked at about 3,000 in October the 1st of 2021. So how do drugs and alcohol affect juveniles? Uh, drugs and alcohol can seem very cool to children at a young age, and the thought of doing drugs and alcohol uh, made you seem like you were the cool kid. Uh, but in reality, it leads to many addictions in children and uncontrollable actions. Studies have shown that 80% of minors in state juvenile justice systems were under the influence of drugs or alcohol when committing their crimes, tested positive for drugs when they were arrested for, for committing crime, and also they 
had got arrested for alcohol or drug offenses, admitting to having substance abuse or addiction problems, or even shared a combination of many of those um, together. Uh, research has also shown a correlation between teen criminality and substance abuse. 44% of minors arrested for bur burglar burglary claimed to commit their crimes in order to buy drugs. And a third of teens arrested for assault claimed to have been drunk or high during the assault during when the assault had occurred. Chronic violent young offenders are three times as likely to drink alcohol and twice as likely to have smoked marijuana. These statistics show how drugs can influence children and make them not be aware of their consequences um, for the crimes they have committed. Nicotine nowadays plays a major addiction factor for children in middle school and high school. Nicotine is a highly addictive substance, substance that can affect the way juveniles' brain uh, control their impulses. This can lead them to make irrational decisions, uh, which can cause them to make life-changing decisions. Alcohol can also be detrimental to the brain of a juvenile because it can cause damage to the brain and memory, and it also reduces the brain's metabolism, as shown in the picture here. So how does family life uh, influence juveniles? Parenting styles play a, a major role in um, the influence on juveniles because I've researched two which were neglectful and permissive parenting. So neglectful parenting is a style in which leaves the children living in an unwanted lifestyle environment. Most of the parents in neglectful parenting are lower income families and are drug and addiction related cases. The children grow up taking care of their parents and trying to figure out how to make a life out of the situation they are currently involved in. Permissive parenting is when the child is doing things that they are not supposed to be doing and the parents kind of neglect a consequence to the child because they don't want to deal with the outcome of the child's behavior. The parents do not establish any rules to the children and they're allowed to do anything they want uh, without consequence. This is a problem because children believe that they can do anything and they won't have any consequence and everything that they do is right. Um, so a parent's behavior heavily impacts a child's behavior because the child's mind is like the line, monkey see, monkey do. Children tend to copy things that they have seen their parents do in the past. So if a parent isn't being vigilant uh, and allowing their children to watch them steal, fight, do drugs, and fall into addictions, there's a possibility that the child will go into the same habits or end up emotionally distressed and start doing unlawful things and getting into trouble with the law. So moving into the uh, social status, uh, I've, like I said, I viewed two, I viewed a case, Eric Smith, and I've also viewed another case which included the Menendez brothers. And both of these included very two, two very different social classes. Uh, so Eric, the Eric Smith case was more of a middle and lower class uh, case and then the Menendez's brothers were uh, upper class. Uh, viewing these cases and seeing the damage that was caused, you can see that not much of the cases were based solely on where you were standing in social class. Uh, you could be the richest person or you could be the poorest person and you could still have something trigger you into doing something that is very, very life changing. For my project, I also did a few interviews. Uh, I actually had interviewed a family member. Uh, he wishes to keep his name confidential, uh, but he was a juvenile delinquent in his early life. Uh, he had gone through the experience of being addicted to drugs and alcohol, and that very negatively altered his life uh, in the future. So majority of his use of drugs and alcohol started in middle school and high school. Uh, and. He stated that at the time he thought it was the cool thing to be doing um, and so he thought his friends would be you know more likely to hang out with him and want to be with him if he started doing the same things they were doing so it started with just smoking and drinking occasionally to escalating and doing uh, these things multiple times throughout the day uh, this caused him to 
have grown apart from his family uh, and his parents specifically uh, because they did not really know what was going on at the time. Um, after a while though, after not being home at certain hours or basically all day and barely making the Chicago curfew, uh, his mother realized one day that he had smelled like a bunch of marijuana and she questioned as to why his eyes were very low and red. And that day he was disciplined by his mother for doing those drugs. But by this time, he had not really cared for anyone's consequences. He kind of just did whatever he wanted to do and was not going to listen to anyone. So at this point, his parents decided to, at the age of 16, send him to a juvenile detention center for two years to help him with his addiction and behavioral problems. After two years, he was released uh, and he did gain a lot of a uh, more, lot more respect for himself, not only, but also his family and his parents. But just after a few months of being out, he fell back into the same bad habits again. And by the age of 18, uh, sh a few months shortly after he got out of the juvenile detention center, he got arrested for selling drugs and being under the influence, which led him to go to jail for one year. Um, and so at the end of my interview, with him, I had asked him if he had any messages for the children who are currently doing drugs and alcohol, and he replied with, to, uh, don't think it's cool because it isn't. Uh, it will only lead you into a negative direction that you don't want to go through for the rest of your life. So moving into mental health. So... With the mental health aspect of things, most crimes that are committed by juveniles uh, are committed due to some type of factor that led up to a boiling point uh, to do the crime. Emotional distress, like physical and sexual abuse, are some examples that can cause children to do things that aren't morally right, like drugs, stealing, crimes, and murder. Physical abuse can cause connectivity issues within the brain. This makes it difficult for the children to express their feelings uh, normally, so they find other ways to express themselves, which could cause danger to themselves or someone else. Uh, sexual abuse in children can cause them to have trust issues uh, that to the people around them, and especially to those that they are very close with, which could be a parent or a guardian or whoever is the person taking care of them. Uh, researchers have concluded that experiencing abuse in early life could cause lasting connectivity issues within or between important parts of the brain involving the process of emotions. So moving into the Eric Smith case that has to deal with a sort of mental uh, health issue. So first I'm gonna start by explaining the case a little bit. So Eric Smith is an example of a juvenile who was thinking erratically um, at the time that he committed a crime at such a young age. So August 2nd of in 1993, in Steuben County, New York, which is just shortly of three hours from here, uh, Derek Roby, the age of four years old, was murdered and found laying under two stones that crushed his body and head and was left in the woods after being murdered which was out of his control, but in the control of the individual who committed such a crime on a four-year-old boy, which was Eric Smith. Eric Smith had no motive to kill Derek Roby whatsoever. Uh, Derek, the day of his horrible murder, was actually walking to the same day camp Eric was going to attend. Eric had been riding his bike, and he had spotted Derek and told him that uh, he knew a different route to the day camp. So Derek, not knowing what better to do, but he followed him because he thought it would be a better way to get there. So when Derek ended up following him and they just got into the woods, uh, Eric Smith ended up punching him in the face and proceeding to choke him in the woods to where he led him. There are many other uh, in-depth detail to the case, but it is a very sensitive thing to kind of bring up uh, so I'm going to kind of veer off of the sensitive stuff that was in the case. But um, Eric Smith was being bullied in school when he first started kindergarten. So uh, he was bullied for things like having glasses, having red hair, uh, and the way his ears looked. 
So he wanted to express himself one day to somebody because he felt as if he just wanted to punch things and just kind of go on a rage. So he went to his father for help originally, and his father told him to go outside and release all of his energy uh, by punching a punching bag or even punching a tree of some sort. But when Eric had already approached his father at the time, he had already walked in with a whole bunch of bloody knuckles and told him that he had already done what he told him to do. And by that point, his father kind of just brushed him off and told him to just go outside and continue doing what he was doing. So an online article had stated that Eric would throw temper tantrums, bang his head against the walls, uh, had speech problems, smoked cigarettes heavily by the age of nine, and would drool when speaking. This played uh, a factor in his behavior and his mental health because he ended up getting diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, and that is when an individual uh, is unable to control their anger and rage uh, in certain periods of time, and they just tend to let everything out. And that's kind of why he told his father that he just wanted to punch something and uh, he just wanted to let his anger out. And his, his parents basically just kept telling him that, you know, go do things outside and kept brushing him off, uh, which led to him taking out all of his anger on Derek Roby. So while Derek was being murdered, uh, the only thing that Eric was thinking about was all the bullies who had ruined his life and who has made his life very difficult for him. Uh, Eric thought about all the times that people called him names and talked about his appearance. Uh, having that intermittent explosive disorder, uh, it could be associated with the years of bullying that he had went through and endured. Uh, when he had gotten the chance that one day when he was riding his bike, uh, he definitely took that chance. And unfortunately, uh, he, took that, he took that chance and took the life of Derek Roby, who was an innocent young boy who had nothing to do uh, with Eric and the way he felt. And he never once in his life had hurt Eric in any way. So Eric had been uh, awaiting to get out on parole. Uh, he has had 10 parole hearings thus far. And just recently, this past August, he was released on parole and allowed to attempt a normal life. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about my next case, which is the Menendez brothers. The Menendez brothers were two brothers who had murdered their parents with a shotgun. And then they had called 911 and stated that someone had killed their parents. Uh, so the boys, they both played it off as they weren't home at the time, and they ended up going to the movies and spending time there, and then when they got home, they just saw their parents dead on the ground. Uh, so before they had called the cops hysterically crying and reporting this, they had picked up all the evidence and the shotgun, and they had thrown it over the canyon. And then that's when they returned home and called the cops and stated that someone had murdered their parents. But in reality, it was the two of them that had done the crime. Uh, Things soon became very questionable when uh, they had the, the law enforcement had figured out that a few days prior to the murder, the two boys had bought uh, a shotgun. And not shortly after that, Eric had confessed to his therapist, Les Zolier, that he had murdered his parents. Um, and at that point, uh, the therapist had been recording some of the sessions uh, just for legal purposes, uh, and that's how that had become expo uh, exposed to the, the law enforcement, and they ended up going to jail. So mental health played a role in this case uh, because the background to it, based off of their story, was that they confessed that their father had molested them at a young age, and they were fearful of the man that he has become. In this case, uh, Lyle, which is the younger brother, he was sexually abused by his father, and that caused him to be afraid his whole entire life growing up. Uh, his brother Eric, which is the older brother, he was the one that tried to keep him safe and tried to make sure that no one was going to hurt him in the end. Uh, and after realizing 
uh, Lyle was just in constant fear and uh, the stuff that he had endured during his childhood just caused so much emotional damage. They both came to the conclusion that they just needed to eliminate the problem. And they both knew that they had enough of their perfect life that everyone saw on the outside. Uh, so their father to them was a monster and the only way to live without fear in their mind was to kill him and in the end they also killed their mother. Um, so in this case, emotional distress uh, was the cause of the crime that has been committed. Um, this was based off of the sexual abuse that was done in, the, in their early lives that eventually uh, went into PTSD to their, um, to their adolescent years of life. The consequence of this case uh, was that their parents were, uh, I mean, sorry, excuse me. The consequence of this crime of murdering their parents was they have to spend the rest of their life in prison without the ability of getting parole. So now I'm gonna move in and talk about how media uh, has an impact on juveniles. Um, nowadays, many children play video games and they're glued on their screens and on their phones. Um, and this kind of plays in a, a little bit of a factor into why they commit the crimes that they do because many video games uh, nowadays, they're just based off of a lot of violence. Uh, for example, in PlayStation and Xbox games, they include games which kill other people within the game in order to get a title or a victory in the game. So the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Academy of Children and Adolescent Psych Psychiatry stated that exposure to violent media can cause children to contribute to the, uh, those violent actions in real life. Uh, and also they're just spending too much screen time on on video games and on things like that um, and also lead them to become very antisocial and potentially become bullied in school. So in this picture uh, here uh, and this graph here, uh, this is from 2012 to 2018. You can see that uh, more than once a day, the first, the first little uh, graph, uh, bar graph there, uh, it shows that uh, 13 to 7 year, 17 year olds uh, checked their social media. It went from 34% in 2012 to 70% in 2018. So you could see how much uh, of a growth it had there. And it goes from hourly to almost constantly being on their phones and checking their social media and just being uh, on, their, on their Twitter and stuff like that. <coughs> Um, so going into my last interview that I had during this research project, I interviewed with Christine Lamarand, and she is a clinical director at Northern Human Services. Uh, Northern Human Services, it, it provides professional support and services to people who are affected by mental health il illnesses, substance abuse, development disabilities, and brain injuries. Many of the points that she had made during the interview was that many cases she had dealt with, uh, they did not include that much media playing a big factor in the juveniles, uh, what the juveniles did. It was mostly the way that they were brought up by their parents, which goes back to the parenting styles. Um, so she mentioned the discipline versus the no discipline. Uh, she mentions that many children who were raised without discipline have a hard time adjusting to real life uh, rules when they get older and uh, abiding by them. Uh, she mentioned the copycat, which is uh, um, when the parent basically goes out and uh, let's say steals for their family in order to provide food for them. The, the kid sees that as trying to just provide for uh, the family. And they tend to try to do the same thing when they go out to the store. Let's say if their little brother or sister wanted a piece of candy and they can't afford to buy the piece of candy, they're gonna go out and do what their parent did just in order to, to be able to provide for their brother or sister. 
And then just trying to survive in poverty environments. Uh, they go through many hardships living in poverty and they think that the world is to blame for, for everything that's going on in their lives. Uh, and that's what initiates them to do the crimes that they do. Um, so that was my interview with uh, Christine. So for, so for my project overall, what was to blame for the juvenile delinquency? The, the highest percent seen in, in my research was that mental, the mental health uh, category. That was the biggest, uh, the biggest percentage for my study. So studies have suggested that about two thirds of youths in detention or correct, correctional settings have at least one diagnosable mental health problem compared with an estimated nine to 22% of the general youth population. So the picture here, it kind of shows uh, how 70% of the juveniles in the justice system suffer from mental health disorders and 27% of those uh, experience disorders so severe that their ability to function is significantly impaired. So I just wanted to thank my mentor for helping me throughout my research project and guiding me throughout my last two semesters. And I wanted to thank Mr. Fitel for all your help and your guidance for my project. Our next presenter is Gianna Mayo. Hi, my name is Gianna Mayo, and I am a dual major in digital media marketing and photography, and today I'm going to be talking about the inspirations and influences on portrait photography. So the original goal of this research was to examine the ever-changing evolution of technology in portrait photography. From the daguerreotypes in the camera obscura to the modern day digital age by serving a diverse variety of portrait photographers and evaluating their different styles of portrait photography during their careers. The research eventually led me to broadening this examination and the influence and inspiration of a specific group of 20th and 21st century portrait photographers, allowing me to gain inspiration from many reputable portraits. This inspiration has led me to a hands-on exploration of each individual photographer's style and process. And today I'll explain the origins of photography as well as the four selected photographer styles and share portraits inspired by their works. The dawn of photography is like a rabbit hole. The more you research and learn about it, the more you uncover. It first started off with the camera obscura in 1685. Translated from Latin meaning dark room, it works when light enters through a minute hole in a darkened room with an image projecting upside down on a wall, so meaning it is not permanent. While the idea of a permanent image existed before the late Renaissance era and the camera obscura actively being produced in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was not until 1839 that chemical processing for photography was discovered. This allowed for photographers to capture an image through chemical processing and light permanently, unlike the camera obscura, which only allowed for a temporary visual piece. The first form of photographic chemical processing was created by Louis Daguerre and was eventually called the daguerreotype. It works when a copper plate is polished, coated with silver, treated with a layer of light sensitive iodide, and carried to a light proof holder where it exposed and the exposes the image inside. This further led to an invisible looking image on a plate. It is exposed and then developed by mercury, which is very toxic to the photographer, which led to many deaths during this time. 
The first notable photograph was a heliographic taken by Joseph Nesforneps in 1826 or 1827 from a window of his family home in La Grasse, France, hence the name. It is estimated to have been exposed for about eight hours, and although the image is very hard to make out, the basic outline can still um, be seen, and as of today, it's still on display at UT Austin. In addition, the first notable self-portrait was taken by Robert Cornelius in 1839. Cornelius, who was from Philadelphia, was working out of doors to take advantage of light and made this head and shoulder self-portrait with a box fitted with a lens from an opera glass. It is estimated to have been exposed for about three to 15 minutes, which is really why it took so long for a portrait to be taken in the first place. Cameras nowadays give you the ability to change all sorts of settings from exposure to shutter speed. Cornelius did not have the ability to adjust anything because of te technology at the time did not have the features to do so. So he had to comp sit completely still in order to capture this image, something I know I would not be able to do. In the end, this resulted in skepticism, which can be seen on Cornelius's face. He seemed to be, seems to be very skeptical due to not really knowing if the portrait would work out in his favor. Flash forward to modern day technology, we are now actively able to take portraits really anywhere, to a point where it is what people do on a daily basis as a professional career. While in today's age, the process of photography is easier than ever, if a photograph doesn't work out, we can take another, and then another. And the overall results of these advancements in portraits nowadays are almost too relaxed due to an increased confidence due to using the various technologies available today. And this is true in all the photo photographs and portrait photographers that I've researched. The first photographer that I researched was Annie Leibowitz, easily one of the most recognizable and famous portrait photographers. Best known for being the photographer of celebrities, who over the years has become a celebrity herself. Leibowitz's photographs tend to be very recognizable due to the fact that they include bright colors, intense lighting, as well as unique and surprising poses and locations. I was inspired by these characteristics when out shooting a shot that inspired her shoot with Rihanna in April 2011. My shot on the right was actually taken by accident on Sylvan Beach but I feel that it captures the randomness um, and uniqueness that I was striving for similarly to Leibowitz's. The second photographer that I researched was Mark Seliger, best known for his black and white portraiture. Although not all of his done work is done in black and white, he has stated that he removed color from images because it instantly feels more theatrical and elevated as well as gives the image a certain form of elegance and gravitas. Seliger is also known for doing the Vanity Fair Oscars after party shoot that contains various celebrities every year, which was fully inspired um, when I did the shot in Denver at PTK Catalyst last month. I vaguely told the girl what to do and I definitely feel like she captured what I was going for, and especially with the light, it adds some sort of clean, like cleanliness and makes it look unique. The third photographer that I researched was Corinne Day, best known for a plain and planted of work and being, able, being the one to revolutionize and steer away from a stereotypical clean-cut portrait turn fashion. She created the grunge style, and which made le easily made her stand out amongst her peers. She's a photographer who gained Kate Moss her fame. In addition to doing black and white, Day was not too fond of fake poses and phony faces. So her ultimate goal was to install some reality in the world that included a lot of fantasy. The shot on the right was a recreation of the photograph on the left, and it was another one that happened to be taken by random, but she definitely captivated what I was going for. And last but not least, the fourth photographer that I researched was Martin Schoeller. No matter if he's taking an environmental portrait or one of his famous uptight close shots, 
Schwaller's work is easily recognizable. He has, he has photographed hundreds of celebrities of all types, first starting off taking the photographs of random people on the street, which qu quickly grew him some recognition and gave him the opportunity to be noticed due to his visual impact as, of photog photographing people from unique perspectives. The shot on the right was me trying to recreate the signature up close style, but also incorporating the environmental um, aspect that he often does. This was taken at Sylvan Beach and was shot with my 300 millimeter lens, and I was standing about four to five feet away, which is just what he does. In the end, a picture is worth a thousand words. A complex idea can, can be conveyed with a single image, namely making it possible to get varying understandings and meanings. That complex idea to have a permanent image and all those photographers have embraced. For reference, Seliger's first camera was a Diana camera, the one that Diana, Princess of Wales, made popular. Well, Leibowitz started off with a Manola and traded it for a Nikon with a 35 millimeter lens. Since they are 10 years apart, it's really interesting to look at how their careers evolved and what equipment they used to get their career started, especially because they both ended up landing the same job at different times as chief photographer for the Rolling Stones. From the evolution of photography, it's very interesting and it's amazing that all these photographers have created their own paths with having very different starts in life. All got their start in photography at different times, which is ultimately where the overall inspiration and influence has come into play. The key reasoning for choosing photographers who are relatively close in age is to depict how technology has impacted their own personal growth. All grew up in very different parts of the world. Leibowitz grew up in Connecticut, Seliger in Texas, Day in England, and Schweller in Germany. And all have very different types of variables that help them reach their various goals. And that is why portraiture and really photography in general is so diverse in the first place. Thank you. Our next presenter is Morgan Flans. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm Morgan Flans, um, and I am here to talk to you about arts and crafts. First, I'm going to provide you with two definitions. The first definition comes from the definition of art by M.W. Rowe, which not surprisingly defines art. <laughs> he defines art as a physical object or a type which can and is intended to support absorbed, disinterested contemplation by either sight, hearing, or touch, or some combination of these on the basis of correctly apprehending it. 
The second definition is from crafting creativity and creating craft. Craftivism, art education, and contemporary culture by Courtney Lee Wida, who defines craft as the skill of making something, where success is measured by the quality of things made, how well components fit together, how details are treated, how well form, material, or way of fashioning serve their function. Craft is typically seen as a lower form of art, due to the idea that it is strictly functional, making it allegedly unsuitable for aesthetic appreciation. Fiber crafts in particular have been seen as women's work, but recently there have been efforts to reclaim them as both historically important art and a form of activism. Craftivism allows women to express gender equality through historically feminine means, but craftivism must be careful to avoid reproducing problematic views of race and class in their working communities. The word craftivism was a portmanteau coined by Betsy Greer in 2002 to express her use of craft in social or political activism, a term which can be used retroactively to define many earlier projects. The movement quickly grew in popularity and would come to include projects ranging from serious memorials, such as the AIDS quilt, to small handmade objects which make their points of irony. During this, the 20th year anniversary of the coining of the term craftivism, I would like to examine these fiber crafts and how the way we view them is being changed through activism. First, I'm going to start with knitting. Does anyone here knit? Raise your hand if you knit or know anyone who knits. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, even if you don't knit or know anyone who knits, you probably know the biggest cliche about knitting. Um, this being, of course, the little old lady who knits constantly and owns about 1,000 cats, all of which have their own little personalized cat sweaters. Um, but did you know that, historically, knitting was important to both genders? The earliest surviving example um, of knitting is a pair of Egyptian socks from possibly as early as the 7th century, though the exact date is unknown. Historically, only men could knit as a career. Women had the job of creating the wool that would be turned into clothing for their families. This was a long, difficult process. It began with shearing the wool off the sheep, cleaning the wool, and then weaving it on giant hand looms. Um, okay. um, this white gray wool would then be dyed using dye made from plants, chamber lye, which is a mixture of urine and salt, gross, or a mixture of ash and salt called ash lye, which is less gross. Um, you would not be mistaken in thinking that this procedure resembles more that of a chemist in a lab creating strange concoctions than a stereotypical housewife spending her afternoon at home. These hand-sheared, hand-spun, hand-dyed pieces definitely inspire absorbed contemplation. Knitting is also a very popular medium in craftivism. Many craftivists take part in graffiti knitting, which is when knitted pieces are created by craftivist groups and attached to existing structures in public places. For instance, a group of craftivists in Britain attached knitted sheep to a bridge where historically only wealthy white men were allowed to cross with their sheep. The knitted sheep brought attention to the often ignored bigoted history of the bridge. Graffiti knitting which can be a great way to bring awareness to political causes and problems, can also have several drawbacks. These craftivists are not always as sensitive to class and race as they could be. Samantha Close, author of Knitting Activism, Knitting Gender, Knitting Race, identifies the graffiti knitting movement as a mainly white feminist movement which appropriates the concept of graffiti. It is mostly made up of white women who are less likely to face the same consequences for their public art as African American graffiti artists. A group of craftivist women creating art near the Olympic Games, for example, took photos of security guards for hours before being asked to remove their art. In contrast, at these same Olympic Games, a group of famous graffiti artists who are all African American men were threatened with jail time for being near the stadium, and many of their works were painted over, including those that had been commissioned years before by the owners of the building. Meanwhile, at a craft fair celebrating craftivism in downtown Detroit, a 77.1% African-American city, 91% of all of those in attendance, both crafters and participants, identified as white. 
There can also be a strong favor of elitism and classism around graffiti knitting. I want all of you to look at this page and try to guess which one of these pieces does not technically count as graffiti knitting. You see the hot pink um, knitted bowl on the top? It's that one, yeah. Um, the artist Olek, who created this lovely pink sweater for charging bowl, refuses to use the term graffiti knitting, stating that her art is work, her, wor her work is art, and other people's is not. She claims that craftivists are not artists and states that not everyone's work deserves to be in public. I think that is a load of bull. <laughs> um, the concept of graffiti knitting itself can suggest privilege. The craftivists would have to have the time to learn to knit, buy large amounts of yarn, go to public places, knit there for hours at a time, and then leave the yarn where it will completely disintegrate. More recent projects, such as Knit the Bridge, tackle these problems by being inclusive and inviting participants from diverse neighborhoods. Small pieces are knitted in groups and later made into blankets, which are then distributed to homeless shelters and animal shelters. Many craftivists have privilege, which they need to recognize in order to begin addressing the problems with this movement. Beginning in the 1800s, oh, sorry, um, wrong paragraph. The creation of thread and fabric are as complex as the creation of yarn. Historically, thread would be made with flax or hemp, which would repeatedly be soaked in water, be scraped with knives, placed in hot ash lye in a process known as bucking, and then spun into thread, which would then be woven into cloth. Once the cloth was produced, it had to be stretched, and the bucking process began again. Beginning in the 1800s, embroidery became very popular. One obvious purpose of embroidery was to add designs onto pre-existing everyday materials, such as handkerchiefs. One question I found myself asking is what really is the difference between a skilled painter working on canvas and skilled embroiderer working on fabric on a hoop? Embroidery and fine art even share subjects such as flowers, portraits, scenes, still lives, and landscapes. One very interesting genre that borders the line between art and craft is mourning pieces. This is a typical example done in mixed media, which includes embroidery, India ink, and watercolor. It is a form of memorial meant to pass on knowledge of a deceased family member and showing the element of family that was a key part of women's lives at this time. These women used the tools and themes available to them to produce art that was socially acceptable. The 1920s housewife who received sewing patterns from magazines such as Modern Woman and Women's Weekly is at the heart of the debate over what counts as feminist art. These patterns could be seen as a way to control what women made, teaching each woman to create the same object in the same way, without any creativity. I prefer to view them as, a teaching, as teaching women how to create and opening their eyes to the possibilities. In Use Your Hands for Happiness, Homecraft, Make Do and Mend in British Women's Magazines in the 1920s and 1930s, historian Fiona Hackney splits these crafts into two categories, handicrafts and homecrafts. Handicrafts require the creator to have some level of skill and experience, and be prepared to put time and effort into the project, while homecrafts do not. The argument that home crafts are lesser because they are seen as simpler and take less time is inherently pretty elitist. It, in, it ignores the fact that even a talented embroiderer may not always want to or have time to work on the most complex projects, but even she had to start with the basics. Hackney's view of embroidery tries to uplift some of the women who created craft using these magazines, but ultimately fails. By trying to split art from what is deemed too basic to count as art, she falls into the same trap as Olek. While craftivism can be problematic, it has also modernized crafts, allowing the artists to create them to subvert gender roles. For instance, the Uterus Flag Project was created by the Craftivist Collective to bring women's health into the spotlight, giving attention to taboos around discussing the uterus. By invoking the image of the uterus, these women are calling attention to how women's health is often ignored, and using historically feminine means to call for equal treatment in medical care. Gender equality in relationships is addressed by the Swedish artist Oza Shagerstrom in her cleverly embroidered book covers. The cover of The Beginning is Not the Worst 
uses a style of stitching that goes back to the 1700s to create two small portraits made up of square stitches. She creates space between the two portraits with a series of white square stitches, representing a sense of isolation and distance from the figure's relationship. In her later book, Swine, the cover is based on the famous Nil von Dardal painting, The Dying Dandy, which portrays the abusive male main character being cared for by the women in his life that he manipulates. She uses several different types of stitches, including chain stitches and stem stitches, to replicate paint strokes. In both pieces, Shayer Strum combines traditional art forms with modern themes in order to comment on historically valued men's art. A United Kingdom charity called Fine Cell Work uses more traditional forms of cross-stitching to reach across class lines and helps prison inmates by providing them with a comforting, creative pastime. Many prisoners have reported that cross-stitch has helped them to cope and form positive relationships with others. This is an example of successful non-elitist craftivism. Quilting, unlike other crafts, was practiced by all classes. It was a communal activity where women would gather in their homes, or outside their homes, and quilt together. Quilting was often done with a careful sense of precision and color to make both functioning and aesthetically appealing objects. Quilting was also a coping strategy for men and women going through difficult situations. Women often quilted to distract themselves from grief or boredom, and wounded Union soldiers quilted. Quilting has always been a form of art with a sense of imagination and purpose. Quilting also has a long and interesting history of being used as a tool for activism. One of the most famous pieces of craftivism is the AIDS quilt. The stunning memorial, made up of over 1,000 individual quilt blocks, was created by friends and family of those who died from AIDS. The AIDS quilt was started by Cleve Jones to bring attention to the people who had died but at the time were ignored by the public. The idea came to him after a 1,000 people in San Francisco had died of AIDS. He was quoted as saying, oh, sorry, um, it is it, a quote from one of my sources says that it occurred to him that if that many corpses were to litter a field, the public would perceive the extent of such a loss. Jones began the quilt by making a panel the size of the average grave, bearing the name of his friend Marvin Feldman, who had died of AIDS. Word of the quilt began to spread as it was featured in pride parades and displayed in the mall on, in Washington. Like the morning pieces, this is craftivism as a form of preservation, a way to tell the story of both the people lost and the people who loved them and made the square for them. This craftivism is inclusive, highlighting the lives lost to the tragedy of the AIDS epidemic. All of these pieces are art. Would Van Gogh's Starry Night be less worthy of being shown in museums if it was embroidered instead of painted. It is not the medium that makes something art. It is not the gender of the creator that makes something art. The intentions behind the piece, the hands creating, the mind that gives the piece purpose, these make it art. Craft was what was available to women, and they made it into art with meaning and purpose. Art that told stories, art that helped people, art that raised money for charities. 20 years after Betsy Greer, Craftivism continues to be an important form of activism and is making efforts to address the movement's issues with race and class. On her website, Greer offers Solidarity Bunting DIY kits, first added in the summer of 2020, to help parents explain the Black Lives Matter protests to their young children. Their children, so, so small banners emblazoned with the word solidarity with help from a parent and read from a booklet that includes short readings explaining activism in ways that are both informational and child friendly. In an era where more states are legislating against teaching children about racism, craftivism can help. I would like to thank my advisor, Christine Miller, and thank all of you for being a great audience. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a short break um, before our final two presenters. Um, we'll come back together and say 11.35. Help yourself through our refreshments in the back of the room.
If you want to please take your seat, we'll come back together for our last two presenters. Our next presenter is Sarah Hung. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah Hong, and this is my welcome to my presentation. And this is my area of research. My mentor is Michael Brown, and he specializes in respiratory care. And this is what I'm going to be talking about. It's on Western medicine and Eastern medicine and chronic coughing. First of all, these are the things that we'll be covering today. First off is what does coughing does and the definition of chronic coughing. We'll be also delving into some common causes of chronic coughing as well. And going into the history or some background information on Eastern and Western medicine. We will also be discussing differences between the treatments of both medicines and also talk about per my personal experience and wrap it all together for the conclusion. So let's get started on what coughing does. Basically, coughing is the body's defense mechanism of clearing the airway passages for easier breathing. Cough also protects the body and is not always necessary. It's either automatic or deliberate as well. So what's chronic coughing? Well, first off, according to the American College of Chest Physician, physicians, there are three divisions of chronic cough, of cough in general. As you see on the picture to the right, the first one is acute cough, which lasts less than three weeks. The second one is subacute cough, which lasts three to eight weeks. And the one we're going to be talking about today is chronic coughing, which lasts eight weeks are longer in duration. I also want to go into the difference between wet and dry cough. Wet cough is one that has mucus. There's stuff that comes up the, the throat, whereas dry cough is unproductive where it doesn't have mucus. And to the right is like a precursor of some causes of chronic cough, which will be which we will be getting getting in. There are three. These are the three common causes of chronic coughing. As there are many other reasons, but for our purposes today, we'll be looking at these three. <coughs> The first one is upper airway cough syndrome, which is previously known as post-nasal drip. It's caused by allergies and there's characteristics of hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity of cough receptors or also sinusitis or nasal irritation. Cyanitis is, for a fun fact, if you don't know, 
that it's right, it goes up here, well, according to what my mentor says, and they get, if it gets inflamed, like there's inflamed if you, there's pus and swelling, and that will drip down back to over here, your cough receptors, and that will irritate the, that will irritate the receptors and you'll get, you'll get chronic coughing as a result. The second common cause is gastroesophageal reflux disease. This is when stomach acid gets into the esophagus and or the throat or the mouth and this will affect the breathing. It's, uh, the acid is an indicator of this that it can cause irritation to the airy, airy tissues. Last but not least, asthma is the third common cause of chronic coughing. This is when there's obstruction in the airway passages, meaning there's trouble getting the air out of the lungs. For instance, when a person's airways becomes inflamed, narrow as well, this might also produce extra mucus, which would be considered a wet cough. Chronic coughing is often considered a symptom of another disease or other diseases as associated with many respiratory disorders. And on the bottom right left corner, these are the, uh, there's other causes of chronic coughs also. And actually, there are other unknown causes of chronic cough. Some people have it, but they don't know what causes it. It's also considered an isolated symptom, or there's other etiologies as well, or idiopathic, which there's an unknown cause to the disease. So does anybody here know what Easter medicine is? Does anybody ever use it? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> so this is, we'll be getting into what Eastern and Western medicine is. This is a general overview of the differences. The left is Eastern medicine, or also known as traditional Chinese medicine. And the right side is Western medicine, which, we'll, which we are pretty much familiar with in general. So first off, what's Western medicine? Okay, I'm pretty much sure you guys all know what it is, but it's uh, used in mostly developed countries with mostly the um, techni improved techni technological uh, advancements. And it has been revolutionized 150 years from now. Actually, it's, it has a shorter time frame than Eastern medicine. But in general, this is a little fact that um, in Greeks there was limited practice. It was kind of lost in the Middle Ages, but it has rebuilt through the 1800s of the Renaissance and such, and it took off from there. There has been improvements in virology, antibiotics, anatomy, physiology, microbiology, genetics, bacteriology, ETC. And it's primarily used in like this country as well. There are um, also strong side effects. It's really effective. It's strong and cures the symptom, but it doesn't actually solve the root of those problem as will be as is compared to Eastern medicine. And these are the general treatments if anybody use uh, for Western medicine, they have surgery, pharmaceuticals and radiation. It also looks and diagnoses and treats an illness illness based on the patient's symptom. Mm. 
Now you guys are all going to be learning about what Easter medicine is. So this is a medicine that dates back to thousands of years. Uh, according to an article, it, was, it has been documented for 2,500 years, and it's also known as alternative, ethnic, or complementary medicine. It has a, clearly, it has a longer historical timeline than Western medicine, and it is the oldest form of healthcare worldwide. In addition, it's based on empirical knowledge concepts, forms, theories, the address impact of the disease on the whole body. Mainly, it's uh, trying to restore balance based on the yin and yang theory. And general treatments incorporate oriental body work, acupuncture, nuclear nutritional, pseudical science, nutrition, and such. This one is more prevention-based and is focused on the whole body, not just the symptoms. So there's um, a specific difference between both medicines. This is also another Comparison between both the left side is on Western medicine and the east side is on Eastern medicine. This looks at the main differences between both, where west side is more well, the me Western medicine is more standards standardized and evidence based, and uses per chemical compounds as their treatments. Whereas the east side, it's more individualized and experience-based. And they use herbs and natural agents. This is the treatment of chronic cough by Western medicine. So first off, as a generalization, as you look on the left, right side, that is some general treatments they use for cough. The left bottom corner is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, which is also known as ACE inhibitors. Well, some people have high blood pressure or hypertension, and these are, it's primarily, primarily found in female patients. And this is, this is the treatment they are on for hypertension. But it can also cause chronic coughing as well. So in this case, they would have to stop taking this treatment and have to find another option because this causes chronic cough in some people. <coughs> but it's different for every individual. Obviously, if you're smoking, don't smoke, because that would cause cough too. I mean, it will probably subside after you stop smoking in a few weeks. But mainly, yeah, no smoking. <laughs> and then UACS, how to, um, the treatments for UACS by Western medicine or post-nasal drip is antihistamine, which is which that combats allergies and nasal decongestant steroid nasal spray. For the gastroesophageal reflux disease. Proton pump inhibitors is used, which is also known as PPI. And Agnetiz, H2 antagonist, is also used as well. If none of those are uninfected, ineffective, then the last resort would be anti-reflux surgery. For asthma, 
they would use an inhaled bronchodilator that would enlarge the diameter of the bronchioles so it would be easier to get air out of the lungs. Or if that doesn't work, it can also be paired with an inhaled cortical steroid. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of herbs. This is a treatment of chronic cough by Eastern medicine. As can be seen, there's just there's a really a lot of herbs and that could be used to treat chronic cough. And some of these herbs are actually, uh, Western medicine uses these as well because they have some similarities in which Western medicine, they use some of the compounds or herbs they use, that specific, they use that compound. It's also found in Eastern medicine too because Eastern medicine is more, it's dated, has a more longer history and some of the Western medicine's elements Eastern medicine uses. It's based off of that. But just in, Western medicine is more specific. They have a specific compound, specific compound, and it's weighted, um, it's measured. It's measured more, it's measured in a specific compound, whereas Eastern, they just use herbs. So for the diagram up there for Eastern medicine, this is what they use to diagnose cough in general. And according to that condition, they treat it with a specific herb. Mostly Eastern medicine uses herbs or acupuncture. If anybody doesn't know what acupuncture is, that is sticking needles on your back. <laughs> and I don't know if it hurts because I haven't tried it honestly, but some people say it's not bad. And it's, these are commonly used to treat chronic cough. I pulled out a specific treatment for asthma. It's a oral Chinese herb, herbal medicine granule specifically to treat asthma. But the, backs, the backfire is that it's more slow and gradual as opposed to Western medicine, which is strong and attacks the asthma faster. And then the herbs that you see, they were pulled out of a chart and treats different varieties of chronic cough. So this is why I picked this topic and the reason I chose this as it affected me personally. Before I started this project, I thought I was a sufferer of chronic cough because I honestly, I don't know why I cough. This just happens. And it has been with me since high school and you would, you would hear me coughing like the whole day. It was horrible. But I still don't know why and I haven't, <coughs> I haven't yet um, figured out why even though after finishing this project because I think it's more an unknown cough or it's probably based on allergies where it's hard to catch sometimes. Uh, I actually used both methods. They do work to suppress my cough, but I have to do it in a consistent manner, which sometimes I cannot follow. And the, in the right side is some variables that affect the outcome of the treatment. Is that I don't know what's the specific problem of my coughing and the root cause. Uh, there's a reason why I put the right left cut, uh, picture on the bottom. It's because mine is considered a dry cough. And I, it's, I think it's, un, it's of unknown origin. I just want to put out there as a, as a representation because I think mine is more of an isolated symptom of a nonspecific cough as seen on the right side. And there in the 
normal expected and specific cost is mainly based on the other common causes of chronic cough. So in conclusion, the, effective, the effectiveness complete, the completely depends on the individual because everyone is different and what seems to work for one doesn't seem to work for another. They both are successful in treating chronic cough if used correctly and accurately. This is also setting as sets another alternative of treatment and more exploration of contemporary complementary or alternative medicine, which is also known as Eastern medicine. There was actually a case, and it doesn't actually pertain to chronic cough. It's on allergies. I couldn't find one specifically on chronic cough, but this pretty much represents what I, I was trying to say, because there was a case in which uh, her father put up with allergy shots for 20 years, and she just didn't want to do that. She went to a uh, Chinese, um, traditional Chinese Easter medicine place recommended by her friend and she went there the doctor sat with her and asked her questions concerning her lifestyle environment and she took the prescribed medication paper and went to a Chinese pharmacist and got the herbs and she, she followed the instructions on how to take the herbs. She boiled it into a tea, and it, she said it was a drink full, the H word. Like, it really it tasted bad, but a bit by bit, her um, allergies went away. So there are, there are advantages and disadvantages, depending on what you want to choose. Like as you can see on here on the bottom comparison chart, Eastern medicine is more cost effective and they use herbal medicines with minor side effects and focuses on the whole body and prevention. Whereas Western medicine, the cost is more high, but if, so, if someone preferred, because Western medicine is considered safe and it's more strong, but there, there are major side effects as well. But if someone wanted um, evidence-based medicine con or controlled trials in science or strong results, this would be their choice. This is just another picture, and it's a step-by-step -step process on the diagnosis, the treatment, and discovery of treatments and approaches to disease by both medicines. This is an overall view and mostly it depends on what individuals want and their, pref and their preference according to their genetics, lifestyle, environment and what they believe is most compatible or works for them, ultimately. And thank you for your time. Is there any questions? No questions? OK. Well. Huh? Does the, does the tea, like chamomile tea, does that count in place to prevent the yeah, yeah, that would count. I usually drink it because my mom forces me to. <laughs> well, she doesn't force me to, but well, it's not bad. But it kind of, it kind of, um, it relieves some of that cough. Like when I drink it, 
But then I have to keep on drinking it and consistent man or else it won't work and that'll backfire. <laughs> yeah. Our final presenter is Miguel Riascos. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Miguel Riasco. I'm from Cali, Colombia. And the topic I choose to talk about in this presentation has to be with invisible barriers. That is a problematic that we have in Colombia in poor neighborhood. Okay? My mentor is Dr. Holly Dobbins. Um, let's start. First thing I want to uh, define what invisible barrier means, because I, I know this is a new topic for a lot of people in many places. So, invisible barrier is a social uh, paradigm created as a defense or mechanism against the fear and risk of any type of violence generated by the presence of gangs within the neighborhood that delimit the community free mobility. That means that for the presence of these gangs in the territory, they, they control where you can go or you cannot go within the neighborhood, you know? And an invisible barrier is created by the presence of two or more gangs within the neighborhood. This gang fight for the control of the power of the territory, thereby symbolically and imaginary define the limits of each one. That means if it, the, within the neighborhood we have like six blocks, they can control two or five of these blocks. If you go through uh, some of this block, you can get hurt because you don't, be, you don't belong to this area. If you don't belong to this area, that means that you can be anyone who can hurt somebody else in the next area. So they control who can get in or who cannot get in to these places. I also wanna, I wanna, I wanna say that I want you to know that this, when I choose this topic and I start doing my research about how, how to support or use reference that support my thesis. I didn't find anything, you know, because this, is, this topic uh, is something that not many people have been writing about. The people have been writing about guns, violence, but not about invisible barriers. So it was hard for me to define and trying to use some reference. What I used, what I did was, based in my experience of, in my interview, trying to build what this topic means, so I can explain to everyone, people can understand. Uh, during this process, uh, I, I use um, a qualitative approach during this research project to identify, evaluate the variable associated with the life condition of people in this vulnerable place. Vulnerable place. Um, How I decide to select the participants, um, I was one of the person who was living in this neighborhood. So uh, during this process, I have met some leaders from the community that helped me out how to s and how to select the person, who, um, how to select the participants during this process. So I choose 39 participants with the help of social and community leaders from the neighborhood. Uh, each leader from each neighborhood, like Mojica, Comuneros, Vallado, Retiro, in the district of Agua Blanca, Agua Blanca district from Cali, Colombia, uh, they helped me out to go through within the neighborhood so I, can, I could choose people inside and talk to them about how this problematic affect the life condition of them, how they live in this neighborhood, you know, how they feel living in this neighborhood, how they end living in this neighborhood too. So, This is Cali, this is Cali, Colombia, this is the map. And we can see that the street to the Agua Blanca is the 
is with the red color. Um, I, I choose this photo from the web, and when I look at this photo, and I see the red color, and compare it with other color, I see there is something else here. There is a, an idea that the street to the Abolanca is the most dangerous place in the city. That's why it's red. You know? That's why it caught my attention when I choose this map. Um, during, this, the, during the process of this interview, uh, the confidence, confidentiality and anonymity uh, will be something that I will, I will keep for myself because it's something that I don't want nobody to, to get access to because can get in, in people who I interview can get in you know, some kind of risk because it's information that nobody can handle beside me right now. So the interview was anonymous in order to protect the identity of the participants. The visual recording were only with external people for the gains. I make a video during this process, but people who we appear in the video for people who doesn't live in the neighborhood or people who don't belong to any gangs in the neighborhood. So they don't have any problem to talk about how this problematic affect the community or affect them during this process. Also, uh, each participant signed a concern form and um, in order to, when I, when I, when I approached them, I, I told them, all the information that I collect during this process will be something that we kept for myself. Nobody can get access to this information. And so you can be, you know, like, don't worry about your safety because I will keep the information for myself. Mm. All the information that I gather to the, during this process will be only used for my research project or future analysis. During the finding and during the interview, the participant refers on the problem of invisible barriers as a fair factor that restrain the mobility with the neighborhood, mobility and safety. Uh, they say that this problem makes them feel afraid every day in this life. You know, uh, sometimes they, they don't know what could happen anytime living in this neighborhood because they, the shooting, the fighting between guns and the control of the territory. Basing in, in my participants or the people I interview with, 64% answered that men are more at risk compared to women, and 31% answered that both are in the same level of risk. Doesn't matter if you are men or you are woman, if you cross the invisible barrier, you can get hurt. But only 3%, only 6% answered that women uh, could be less in risk compared to men. And when we, it, it comes to education, uh, only 3% of the population I interview have university studies, 9% has some college or university study, 49% has finished high school, and 39% didn't, didn't finish high school. And what I analyzed in this information was that 77% of these people were men. That means that the idea that or indicate that that's why men could be more involved in gang situation and compared to women. Because they don't have a, the, the level of education to go and find job or other opportunities to give them the possibility to find something else and don't end in gang situations. In terminal education and, and, and uh, employment job, Based on the interviews, 61% are unemployment, 29% work and informally or under employment contract that don't exceed six months of permanence. So people who live in this neighborhood uh, doesn't have the opportunity to get a new job, a good job, to help them to supply the needs that they need in their house. So this also reflects why most of the young people who 
who live in this neighborhood decide to quit a school and trying to find something else to support the economic needs of the families. Uh, there was something important too. 95% mm, of the people that I interviewed were Afro-Colombian. And these people had been beaten or the for displacement from the Pacific area. That is a place where most black people live in Colombia, you know, because, because Colombia has been a country, and may you know that there has been in world, internal war conflict, internal conflict during more than 60 years. Um, this conflict concentrated in this Pacific area. So most people who live in this area has to live and run away in order to survive. And some of the places that they find to keep going is in the street of Blanca in Cali. They don't have any, uh, they don't have any other place to go and uh, start over. So they choose these places because it doesn't have control of the government so they can set their house in these places and trying to start over, basically. In response to the question, has has a member of your family ever have any connection or belong to any neighborhood gangs? And that was something that caught my attention because uh, out of 17, 11 women answered that no member of the family have any kind of connection or belong to gangs violence. But on the contrary, of 17 men, 12 say yes. Within my family, there are people who belong or have any kind of connection or closeness to the guns violence. Um, that means that men are more involved in are more involved in gun situation uh, than women. So, women trying to be aware away from any kind of conflict, but men, in order to uh, defend their family, defend their territory, they get involved in this type of situations. Uh, when it comes to LGBTQ community, um, that was weird because when I was asking this question, or some of the questions that refer to this topic, this specific uh, uh, community, most of the people trying to avoid the answer, you know, trying to say no, uh, gay people doesn't have any close connection with gangs, but it was because most of the people that I interview belong to the gangs, or young people who was part of the gangs. So there is something that they don't want to, other people know that in some way they have some kind of close connection with these people, with this community uh, in, in particular. But I, when I was walking during the, you know, walking through the, this neighborhood, Mojica, Vallado, Comuneros, and on my, my personal experience too, I see these people involved in these situations. You know, I, I see gay people, lesbian that are part of the gangs and play an important role in these communities, in these uh, gangs. I just want to show you a video. Bueno, el distrito de Agua Blanca como tal, lo que yo tengo entendido, eh, en términos eh, legales o jurídicos, políticos como tal, no existe. Eso es algo más como una, un nombre que se le ha dado desde la misma ciudad.
en todo el pueblo, porque tiene que ser como tal pueblo, donde no te permite, digamos, cruzar una calle o no. Ejemplo, mi familia vive en el en el barrio La Cabaña, ya es casi lo, en los últimos barrios, y es donde hay más estas barreras invisibles, donde no te puedes relacionar, ejemplo, con las personas que se encuentran en, en la siguiente cuadra. Eh, como hay muy pocos establecimientos o pocas tiendas y si hay una ya tú no puedes cruzar entonces de algún modo no permite esa relación entre los mismos ¿sí? entre las personas con las que creciste um, para mí es como la parte una de las una no la única eh, de las partes que siempre ha estado como rezagada, relegada en cuanto a las políticas sociales, en cuanto a las políticas públicas de intervención, ha sido como lo que ha sido la parte del oriente y la parte de la ladera de, de la ciudad, eh, Siloé, Chorros, etc. Ah, ha sido como una zona bastante golpeada siempre por el tema de falta de infraestructura, que hoy en día pues la tiene cada vez más, pero históricamente siempre estuvo eh, atrás. Eh, respecto al sur o respecto al norte de la ciudad eh, y que ha sido una, una parte también que a su vez me parece que es una parte donde uno ve realmente el folclore donde realmente se ve eh, la, la forma de vivir comunitaria donde realmente se ve la forma de vivir, de compartir eh, y donde también se ve pues todo lo que tiene que ver con la cultura popular
problem is that people who live in this neighborhood suffer in relation to invisible barriers. And when I was talking with them, one of the, the, the first topics that they choose when talking about how they feel living in this neighborhood has to be with insecurity. Anytime they walk out of the house, uh, they, they think that anything could happen to them or some of the families members too. So they are afraid all the time living in this neighborhood because they don't have the security of the government support to uh, deal with this problem in this neighborhood. Uh, unemployment, how you see, is one of the main reasons uh, for why young people join to this game in this neighborhood. Uh, there is something that most of them answer when asked why they uh, don't get a job. And the answer was that uh, when they found the name, write the name, and they resume, resume uh, where they live, the application get rejected immediately because they live in this area where people cannot be trusted, you know? So they don't get a job. Uh, fear of being robbed, you know, anytime they walk through the neighborhood, any, any of these young people who belong to the gang can steal something from them. Murder, and one of the experiences uh, that impacted me when uh, I was doing my interview was a 55-year-old uh, girl uh, who, uh, have his son murdered 11 years ago, you know, and the son, his, his, her son was playing in <coughs> was playing soccer, and <coughs> he found himself in the middle of the shooting, the fighting between two gangs, and one of these balls hit him in the head, so he died. And she said that she never will forget that moment, you know, and she missed his, uh, she missed her son, and it's something that she can. She cannot move on this year, basically. Uh, lack of opportunities. A uh, government doesn't have the programs or projects uh, to support these people. Uh, it's like uh, the government doesn't care about these people who live in this area of the city. And there is something that I want you to know. Uh, when we come to the map, I want to go back to the map uh, right here. Uh, the red area is everything belongs to the district of Blanca, but community system belongs to. You see the red line to the by this area to this area. That becomes long time ago an invisible barrier too. You now people who live to this side of the city are afraid to get into <coughs> this area because they say if I go to that area, I wanna get hurt. So it's, an, it's another invisible uh, barrier that exists outside of this neighborhood, you know, because they can't. So Cali has been divided in two, District of Agua Blanca and Cali, you know. And that was when uh, one of the, my interview was talking, say, uh, District of Agua Blanca doesn't exist. It's something that people have given, it's a name that people have been giving through the, 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 through the history because they don't want this area to be part of the Cali because it's black people who live there, uh, doesn't have education, who doesn't have a good job, and doesn't have a good things to offer to the rest of the city. So that is one of the topics, one of the things that uh, I want you to know too. Just not this invisible barrier within the neighborhood, but also this invisible barrier that divides the city in two. Love of the uh, free education, uh, most of the child, uh, young people doesn't go to school because they have most most of them have to pay for education, and they don't have the, the foreign industry has the economic support for this kind of thing that's important. And some of the places that they have the lack drinking water, no electric power. Uh, in this area, we see all the time police abuse. Police come to this place, and it doesn't matter if you, are, you belong to the gang or not, they just treat you like equal. You know, you are bad boy, you are bad girl so you need to be beaten in this area. Drug trafficking, uh, discrimination. Uh, this discrimination is linked with the unemployment because when some of these young people who send them soon to apply for a job and they see that they live in Comuneros, Mojica, Retiro, or other various uh, uh, neighborhoods, neighborhood, 
um, they say, no, you cannot work here because you have very bad background, basically. And police evictions, evictions. So they come to this place that has been occupied for people who came from the Pacific area for the forest plains, and they say, you cannot be here. You know, this is a public area, you cannot occupy this space. So they trying to move these people away from this uh, area. <coughs> Uh, I want to show you also some of the pictures, how the neighborhood looks like. And that was on the of, of my workshop with the leaders. And we're talking about how and where the visible barriers are. But it was something that showed up in this meeting. And we decided to don't show to the people where exactly the invisible barriers are, because we want to protect not just uh, the whole community, but there has a leader too. Because it's the police, the police or government, and get access to this information so they will know where exactly the gang, the gangs are, so they can go through, you know, and do it. we generate a big problem with the community. And most of these little people, you know, I don't want nobody get hurt or get important problems. So this is how the neighborhood looks like. You can see how the street are building, uh, right here. I've been housing that people just go to the place and occupy and start building the house because they don't have anywhere where to go. And this corner in Mojica, right here, is one of the invisible barriers uh, that most affect people's life in the neighborhood. Right here, this corner, right there. You know, If you go through, you pass the next corner, you can get hurt. If you make a left, to the next corner, you get hurt. If you go right, you get hurt. So you cannot go anywhere. And right here in this photo, you, I know you cannot see it, but right in the end of the street, there is a gangs, uh, a gangs that control the area. And the, the funny thing is that they control the back side of the area, but they can control the outside of the area. So when they get when I when I get out of the neighborhood because the only way to get out is through the street. It's no other way. So the only way that they can get out and was funny for me, but it's, it's, it's sad too at the same time. It has to be uh, in times an hour when nobody's in the street, and the only way to get out is in car. They cannot walk through. You know. They cut themselves in the back, so they cannot get. So that is one of the, uh, the situations and how people live in this neighborhood, this poor neighborhood. Uh, the condition life are, uh, are bad. They don't have the, the basic needs to, to live. Uh, all of this electric that they have here is illegal, the connection to the other power uh, tower. So they can get electricity, but they don't have, they don't have water because they don't, you, you see we don't have a, Development uh, uh, infrastructure to go and support them, basically. Mm. All right, I think this is it. I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, I want to say thank you to Mr. Dobbin, Dobbin uh, Holly Dobbin, uh, Dr. Marshall, that always support me when I just got here two years and a half ago. Um, and I say thank you to Dean Jean Roberts for. Uh, so his support when, when I was talking to him about this topic and he said let me go go for you know you can do it and I didn't have a lot of information that's good uh, Michelle thank you so much <coughs> for making this space for everyone to share their experience and the research project and Lindsay William uh, Dr. Donna Man Mannion she was very important to me too during my processes, my process, academic process here. Uh, she was on my profile of, of the gender, and she always was pushing me like, Miguel, go for it, you can do anything, and, and I appreciate that. So I want to mention her because it was important to me. Dr. Lo Lauren William, she was the, the first one in that I present my topic. When I, uh, one of the class, I had to write about something different, and I chose this topic. And we was 
having trouble find resources because it's, nobody has been writing about invisible barriers. And, and she was like, Miguel, let's do something else, you know, use other reference in order to support your thesis, and that was good. I want to say thank you to Professor Brandon. He's not here, but uh, Professor Sun is here uh, on a program. I think uh, during this pro last process, they helped me out a lot in order to how to build uh, a research project, how to analyze the data and information, and, and I think that is important to me. And uh, I want to say thank you. If you have any question, please just go for it. <laughs> thank you. We have one more round of applause for our presenters. Thank you to everyone who presented, and thank you all for coming and supporting the honors program, and have a great day.